In this video we're going to be looking at photoelectricity and the photoelectric effect. Now the photoelectric effect is a strange one. It uh, was one of the first pieces of evidence for light having a dual nature. And uh, the main piece of equipment is the gold leaf electroscope with a vacuum in the middle, a metal pole running down connected to the metal plate at the top, a gold leaf attached to the metal pole, and the plate at the top is usually zinc in this experiment. Now the key thing is that metals conduct electricity well because they have a lot of free electrons and so those electrons will be able to move, any charges will be able to move. So we charge up the electroscope to get an overall negative charge. The metal pole in the middle has a negative charge, the gold leaf has a negative charge, and as a result they repel each other. Now this means that we have an indicator, a way that we can look and see if any effect happens when we shine different lights on it. So to charge it up you build up a static charge on a plastic instrument, something like a ruler and you transfer that negative static charge to the plate at the top. This gives you the deflection, you can just about see it in this video, and gives us our indicator as to whether charge is being gained or lost. Now the first thing that we do then is shine visible light on. Okay, Shining visible light at the surface of the plate unfortunately doesn't really have a very large effect. If we look at the video you'll see it doesn't matter how bright the light is, it doesn't matter how long we shine it at the metal plate for, but that deflection of the gold leaf remains the same. It's not losing charge and it's not gaining charge. The charge is remaining the same on the apparatus. So nothing exciting happens when you turn the visible light onto our gold leaf electroscope. But let's have a look at what happens when we try a different type of light, like ultraviolet. So shining a different light source on the surface triggers a different effect. We end up getting electrons able to leave the surface and freed, which means that the overall charge of the whole system drops. There's fewer negative charges on the metal pole, fewer negative charges on the gold leaf, and the gold leaf collapses back down. It's no longer being deflected as much. And if we look in this video, you can see that as soon as the UV light is shone, on that plate we get relaxation. We get that gold leaf dropping back down, it's losing its negative charge, so is the metal pole in the middle, the repulsion isn't there anymore, so we've got visible proof that electrons have been able to leave the zinc on the surface of the metal plate. What does this tell us? Well, if the wave theory of light was true and you had your wave incident on your metal plate, your zinc, then over time, it doesn't matter how weak the light is or how low frequency it is, that electron would start to soak up the energy until eventually it had soaked up enough energy to be able to escape the zinc plate to become a photoelectron. But of course we don't see that. We saw in the previous video that it doesn't matter how long you shine the light on the surface, that effect doesn't happen. So this means there must be something else going on, something more complicated. It doesn't matter how long you wait, it doesn't matter how bright it is, you could shine it on there for five years and all that's going to happen is you're going to get very, very bored and you're not going to see an effect. The solution to this problem is that light must be travelling as a particle, it must have a distinct package of light energy, a quanta. And so Einstein, when he was theorising this, decided that he would call these packets of light energy photons. But the key thing is each electron can only absorb one individual photon. If that photon doesn't have enough energy, that electron will not leave the surface of the zinc, will not become a photoelectron. But what defines the energy of a photon? Well, if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see that visible light has a fairly long wavelength with respect to ultraviolet. UV light, much shorter wavelength than visible, and therefore you're going to get more waves passing each point per second. That's going to affect its frequency, and so visible light having a longer wavelength has a lower frequency of the order 10 to the 14 hertz 
compared to ultraviolet with a frequency of the order of 10 to the 15. So now we know that UV has a higher frequency than visible. And we know from looking at the gold leaf electroscope experiment, since UV was able to release photoelectrons and visible wasn't, that the energy of the ultraviolet light is greater than the energy of the visible light. And this means that we can form a relationship between the frequency that light has and the energy that it has, or more specifically the photons. The energy is related very closely to the frequency, but we have a constant in here, Planck's constant H. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. This allows us to directly link the energy that an individual photo uh, photon will have to its frequency. So let's do a quick calculation. If visible light has a frequency of 1 times 10 to the 14 hertz, what's the energy of each photon? It's important to note here as well that when you look at visible light, we're going to be expecting frequencies in the region of 1 times 10 to the 14 hertz, certainly of that order of magnitude. So we have our frequency, we know what Planck's constant is, and we know that the energy of an individual photon is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency. If we substitute those numbers into the equation, we're going to get an answer for the energy of each photon. So Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, times the frequency, 1 times 10 to the 14 hertz, will give us an overall energy of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. And again, that kind of magnitude of joules to the minus 20 to the minus 19 is what we're going to be expecting for our answers. If we ramp it up to UV, much bigger frequency, 5 times 10 to the 15 hertz, so an order of magnitude greater, what's the energy of each photon going to be? Well, just like before, we have our frequency, we have Planck's constant, and all we need to do is take our equation E equals HF, and substitute in our numbers. Now obviously UV has a higher frequency so we're going to be expecting each photon of ultraviolet light to have a higher energy than visible light. And when we plug our numbers in we'll see that instead of an order of magnitude of 10 to the minus 20 we get 10 to the minus 18. Two orders of magnitude greater. So UV, much higher energy for each photon within that light. That is why ultraviolet light is able to release a photoelectron and visible energy isn't. But what if we don't know the frequency? Well, quite commonly you might be given the wavelength of a certain light, but not its frequency, and you might still have to work out what the energy of a photon of that light is. Well, we know that E equals HF, and we know from the wave equation that V is F lambda. But because we're dealing with light, we also know that V is equal to C, the speed of light. So we can substitute C in for V and say that C is equal to F lambda. We know lambda and C, and we're looking for F, so we can rearrange that equation to give us f is equal to c divided by lambda. Now that we have a figure for f, we can substitute that in to our e equals hf equation, which yields the equation e equals hc over lambda. And now we have both equations that you need for these kind of questions side by side. E is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, which is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength, and that is the energy for each individual photon of light within that light stream. So let's do a quick calculation example. If we have visible light with a wavelength of 500 nanometers, 
what energy would each photon of that light have? Well, we know that the uh, speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we're told that the wavelength of the visible light is 500 nanometers. Now remember, nano is times 10 to the minus 9. So I could, if I wanted to, simplify that to the wavelength being equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And we plug our numbers into our equation for E equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And that will tell us the energy of each individual photon of light with a wavelength of 500 nanometers. Now 500 nanometers puts it into the visible spectrum. And so you can see once again we are getting orders of magnitude between 10 to the minus 20 and 10 to the minus 19 for visible light. But what defines the energy a photon needs to release that electron? Only certain photons with enough energy will release a photoelectron. And we call the energy needed the work function. So the minimum energy an incident photon needs to release an electron from a metal surface is the work function. So if your photon has energy less than the work function, it'll get absorbed by your electron. But the electron won't gain enough energy to be able to leave the metal surface no photoelectron is released. However, if the energy of your incident photon is greater than the work function, then as it hits and it gets absorbed by the electron, the electron has enough energy to leave the surface of the metal. A photoelectron is released. To work out whether a photon has enough energy to release a photoelectron, we need to know the work function usually given to us, we need to calculate the energy of a photon from the wavelength or frequency using either E equals HF or E equals HC over lambda. And if the photon energy is greater than the work function, then it will work. For example, sodium metal has a work function of 3.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now remember, that is the minimum energy an incident photon needs to be able to transfer that energy to the electron, to give it the energy it needs, to escape the surface of the metal and become a photoelectron. So the work function is the minimum energy our photon needs. Now we know that E equals HF and if we assume that the energy is the work function and we're looking for F we can rearrange the equation to give us frequency is energy divided by Planck's constant. And remember that energy is the minimum energy needed to release a photoelectron, the work function. If we plug those numbers into the equation, the energy, the work function, divided by Planck's constant are 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 then we end up getting a frequency that falls in the expected range that we've seen of 5.43 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And what frequency produces that amount of energy? What frequency does a photon have to have to have enough energy to release a photoelectron? Well, it's our threshold frequency. If you hit the threshold, you hit the minimum requirement. And so, if we know what the work function is, the threshold frequency is the frequency of a photon that will yield the work function. And what about all that extra energy? Well, we've already said that if a photon has more energy than the work function, it will release a photoelectron. But if it has much more energy, and that photoelectron gains the excess energy as kinetic energy. So the energy of your photon minus the work function will give you leftover energy, which is the kinetic energy. Those are the main points. Go away and have a go at the uh, practice questions with your worked answers. And freeze frame here for your summary.